Uh, welcome to the Gnusi Library BOF. I hold a BOF every year just to, again, ask community questions. What do people want to talk about? What are they interested in? I have a couple of slides to cover a topic that I'm interested in talking about. But any questions from anybody here? Shall I do my slides? All right. In April 2012, I gave a talk. And in that talk, I naively wrote the words that more developers, reviewers, and testers were a short-term challenge. In fact, Florian will laugh at this because this talk in 2012, I talked about the TIRPC transition, which we actually completed. I talked about making release branches. We actually have a whole process, and Andreas Hutel from, from, from Gentoo has been doing a fantastic job helping us make the release processes go out the door. I think distribution involvement, I think, was like, uh, I have another page, but here, more distros involved. Uh, Simon, you're here. Uh, there are Gentoo people that are here that are more involved because I think the distributions are one of our primary users. But this piece is this, continues to be this hard piece. Now, I'm not going to say who the next slide is about. And the next slide isn't intended to call anybody out in particular. It's just, in 2012, I gave this talk. And 12 years later, we are still making statements like this. You know, sorry, just a few style knits, you know, space before the parenthesis and string length and free. <laughs> so, <Yeah>. what... <laughs> <laughs> so my question is, why are we still telling people these things? Why are we still talking about, why are we still talking about this problem? How do I format my patches? Why is this so hard? Can I run a tool that will just tell me what the format should be for the patches so that a new contributor, when they come, they don't have to ask anybody any questions. I'll be honest, if someone solves this with la large language models, I'm going to cry. But um, it's one of these cases where it is something that I think we should have solved 12 years ago in 2012 when I gave my talk. I should have, as uh, a senior in the community, said, no, this is, identify this as an issue for new contributors. We should really solve it. Um, so. Uh, sorry for the color, it doesn't quite come out as clearly here, but does indent even work? Does clang format even work? Right? Neither of them work. So I spent a whole day, and I know that's not a lot of time, trying to solve this with what I thought was like, oh, well, we got these pre-existing tools, can't I just bend them to my will? And within 24 hours, I realized, no, we have a lot of like custom things that we do. We want our code to look a particular way, and we want it to have a particular style. So is the, the question I have for the community, is the answer to this that like, should we be writing this ourselves? Is this, is this, will this really help new developers to say like, Whatever linter we run, that we get the output. Joseph Myers and I were talking, and Joseph said, you know, Python black, which is just a thing that you just run, and it formats your Python code to a particular style. It may not be your style, but it's a style, so then you can just run it and get it done. Um, Florian. Um, this should be a GCC option. If it's a GNU project thing, then it should be a GNU project, the compiler option to... <laughs> Enforce the GNU project to code style. I mean, Golang does that, right? The, Go yeah. the Golang compiler has a. Yeah. Ada does it as well. It's in Ada, in the Ada front as, as well. So, why so we make it a compiler problem? <laughs> <laughs> and you get a compiler diagnostic, yeah? Yeah. We could, we could of course, add a GCC option, though. One difficulty there is what we really want is the right formatting before macro expansion. And so glibc inevitably does lots of complicated things with macros, including macros that will do things, create functions, create function aliases, and so on. I think the various weird stuff done with macros, some of which is fairly essential, is, is going to be, make it hard for 
any out-of-the-box thing that assumes what you're writing is C rather than C with additional macro layers needed for this low-level part of the implementation to work. Now, obviously, there are disadvantages in custom things that you're not taking advantage of all the work done in the other tools. They may not be usable for anything else. But one advantage is we could always write a custom thing that maybe just does one thing. For example, maybe you have something that just deals with the spaces after the hashing preprocessor directives and nothing else to start with, and fix up the bugs it finds in the formatting, and then have something in the test suite that verifies things are correctly formatted. And then maybe at some point someone could add one more feature to this customer script that fit, addresses one more bit of formatting and leaves everything else unchanged. And at least if you do something custom, you can make it do very little and gradually add more features, make it change more bits of formatting, rather than needing to get something that definitely works everywhere. If you have something that just does a small bit and maybe even has a list of files that it doesn't do anything on. Yeah, I agree with that position. And it's what I, the position I took with the make file linter, where we now have the alphabetically sorted uh, list of tests in all the make files for the test. And the benefit there is it reduces backport hazard because they're alphabetically listed. So then you probably don't run into a make file conflict one per line. And we turn that into a test that runs so that you, when you run make check, it fails and you have to actually fix up your patches. Right. Um uh, one of the other positives of doing, doing this is that... Is it turned practice, on? Sorry. In practice, for a lot of... Is it on? It is working. It's turned on, but you're it's on. Okay. okay. So, in practice, when you're doing reviews, I think uh, a bunch of the formatting nits are usually space after function name and, you know, uh, braces and that sort of thing. Uh, we don't really look strictly at the GNU style. Uh, like line length may, right? So uh, incrementally adding, like Joseph suggested, probably makes a lot more sense. And and maybe do those checks first and then, you know, add in things that people then start caring about. And I think if you do incremental checking, you can run the checker over the whole code base and fix everything the checker finds. Yeah, I'm going to run it over the whole code base. You can't stop me. Now, another thing to note, so the formatting is one of the things, one of the common nits in reviews that could be expressed as a property of, as a property of the code base. And anything that could be expressed as a property of the code base can, in principle, go in the test suite to verify that it's met. Though that won't help yet with all of the commit. All of the people who submit patches, they clearly haven't run the GLibc test suite on at all. That, no, those will only get detected afterwards in the CI. Now, there are some, so that, so the formatting is one of those nits. We can imagine our checks for other things like checking for undocumented, undocumented functions. There are, not, there are a lot of those. There's a very out of date script in the source tree that might once have checked for them. You could check for things that functions that are not covered in the test suite at all. I did once do some experiments with that, right? Something that looked for symbols in the public, public symbols in the libraries that were not mm -hmm. referenced in any of the test suite binaries after it had been built, that sort of thing. There are some bits that are properties of the patch submission rather than of the source tree and that would need other considerations and will probably need a pull request system first. For example, verifying that someone has put, you could verify as property of the source tree, well, verifying as property probably in practice of a submission, if you're adding a new public function, say there should be a new entry in the news file, and then it should be an entry in the news file for the right version, which means once you've got a pull request system, when a new version, but when a version branches, you want to have something automatically update the existing pull request to say, by the way, remember to move your news entry for this old pull request into the new version since it didn't make that past release. And similarly, new symbol versions for old releases and so on. So there are an awful lot of checks beyond formatting that can be done as properties of the source tree, but at some point we'll need to look as well as the obvious things in review that are necessarily properties of the submission rather than of the source tree as a whole. Yeah, and I find that patch comments, comments, in patch, comments on patch formatting feel judgmental. 
they just don't feel kind to the reviewer, where what, what I really want is just, I want the, the person posting the patch to feel, oh, the system just gave me f feedback, positive feedback about how I do my system, uh, how I should write my patch. And maybe I missed this in the contribution checklist that I'm supposed to run something, right? Make check, for example, because I think putting it in a make check makes sense. And so it's that non-judgmental, here's the tool you run and we all run the tool. So I would love to get to where there's a tool to do this. Uh, but I had not considered, Joseph, your approach of like, do one thing, like space, uh, space after hash, and then do the work to figure out if you can do it in a consistent way with, uh, with a Python script or something to parse all the sources. We could also say, try, even before this, try finding some suitable options for Python Black and run it on our Python scripts. GDB does use Python Black for its Python stuff, so... Maybe we should look format the Python scripts consistently. And yes, we want to do it for C, which is much harder, but no, f still ensuring we're consistent in the formatting of Python in all the Python stuff we have in GLibc is worthwhile as well. Sure, yeah. I, th I think we are less opinionated about Python that we would just run Python Black on all the Python scripts and then convert them all to whatever Python Black decides was the format. But it's, this, it's the contribution to C code that I'm really interested in. Like, how do you write the structs? How do you uh, format the code that you're changing? Um, the other piece might be like, what if you're touching code that's in the shared sources file that's part of GNU lib and has different formatting, then at that point also the parser can look at the shared sources file, which is a mechanically readable file that's in the main directory and say, if it's one of these files, then I'm going to maybe not do anything for now because it's outside of the project and we consider their canonical sources to be in GNU lib. Though Paul Eggert sometimes is like, oh, I thought the canonical sources were glibc. And so, um, I think in these cases, the GNU lib stuff we can just set aside. It's a finite number of files in the tree, but everything else where we own them, we should be reformatting them. And for a long time, I'd say malloc was probably one of the worst offenders because it followed the original formatting style that Doug Lee had had when we imported PT malloc, and it's been reformatted, correct. But for a while, that was one of our problems, that we hadn't yet said, we own the code that's in the repo. We want it formatted to a way that we have been formatting the code in the, within the project. So I would say that uh, that still does not preclude the necessity of a behavior change when we're doing reviews. Uh, sense, which? A behavior change when, when we're doing reviews. In the mm -hmm. sense that when we're doing, uh, when we point out uh, typo nits, uh, like spelling errors, or grammatical errors, or uh, formatting style lists. Uh, I think it should also uh, it should also be necessary that you uh, comment on the meat of the patch. Uh, at mm -hmm. least give some high level comment as to uh, whether the change is desirable or whether it's going in the right direction. Yeah, or something to that effect, so that uh, the submitter at least knows that all of the work that they did is not completely wasted yeah. or is not irrelevant. And the only thing that's relevant is, you know, the, 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 uh, the preposition I missed in my statement. I agree with that. But at the same time, we do want consistency. And so because this is one piece of friction in the process that we're looking to remove, let's remove, it, yeah. remove the friction from the process. Yeah. Wait, if you have topics... Ask for the microphone. So, I have no other slides except for this slide. What do people want to see in the next release? What do we need to get fixed? Is like pthread convar lost signal fix is hot for me. I need to fix that. I need to set time for it. Or we need to get support from other people in the community. Um, the pthread cancellation fix was one thing I wanted to get reviewed from at Hammerval. It's reviewed and in, so the syscall cancellation uh, should be fixed. The, the other piece that might come around to us is the Rust community's focus on concurrent exit was a really 
interesting conversation about a place where the standard said one thing about exit, saying exit's multi-thread safe, but then said, you can only call exit once. So is that really multi-thread safe? <laughs> and then what did we do in glibc? The current release, it's about to go out the door. So here in February, 241 will go out the door with a, a, a exit that takes a recursive lock and stops all other threads from making forward progress on exit. That one thread serializes the execution of all the exit handlers and goes through all the way to exit while the other threads are waiting. But, what? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a recursive lock. Yes, because the at exit handlers have to call exit again. It doesn't matter, we have dependencies on it in the test suite. It's interesting. Yeah. But is there something that you'd like to see? Florian. Um, so um, we have a problem with the current graphical desktop. It sometimes crashes with certain drivers because of get and usage in a multi-threaded context. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, I gave them a fixed glibc, and now they expect us to fix that in glibc. <laughs> so, that is good to know. So the... Uh, and it works for them, and then they said, oh, thank you, that is good enough, uh, we don't have to worry about it anymore. So the, the issue is that uh, we have, pa there are now patches, unfortunately somewhat complex, that make get and thread safe, async signal safe, um, also set env, get un unset env, and basically this way, uh, there's also consistent snapshotting for of the environment for XXVE, so that's also taken care of. But there's some trade-offs in there that might not uh, be what we want. But mm -hmm. I still hope we can get it in 2.41 because it sure the reality is that uh, it's not a required to be thread safe by the standard um, in the sense that these developers expect it to be because they call set end concurrently and change the environment underneath the get end core. But at the same time, this fixes existing application bugs and what they suggested as a workaround was a bit yeah. problematic. So it, uh, I think it, it, uh, we should really try to get this in and fix. And so things. just for clarity, is it this series? Yeah, exactly. Okay. And there's a, another patch we could at this one function, there's this get and vary function that is something that could be exported as an external symbol if we want to. It's which which one? In the middle somewhere, patch number. Yeah, the additional internal get and vary function, this yeah, one? Yeah, that is something you could easily add as a public function. And it has a consistent snapshot of the environment. Yeah. And then you can add additional variables at the end and call POSIX spawn or something like that. Do you have any opinion on the fact that like, we would be, I mean, like, there's some pretty strong wording about how you're supposed to access the environment. Do you think that the desktop developers just, it's like a difficult interface to use correctly? Is that um, your, your interpretation there? They use setenv to communicate with different libraries, I think. And something else calls getenv doing initialization, and then they hit that race condition. So, oh, this doesn't look great. I just tried to plug myself in. I just plugged in right there to get power. Maybe I have to. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Then I'll stay plugged in because otherwise I'm going to run out of battery. So I'll leave that there. Oh, it's this is a little loose maybe. Ta-da! Okay. Um, so I, I don't think they use any of the problematic interfaces. Um, like direct environment access, it's just that currently... <coughs> Excuse me. Center end is not thread safe relative to get end. And, and thread end, set end. I mean, what I expect 
what they probably expect is that the interfaces are empty safe, right? And that they're not looking at the, the like details it, under the hood. It is definitely what we expect inside the Gypsy code base where we call getenv in weird places. So getenv gets marked empty safe and setenv gets marked uh, empty unsafe. No, setenv is also empty safe after the patch. It's fully safe. After the patch. Yeah. But not like today, now, currently. Today, it's uh, uh, every function that accesses the environment is marked as unsafe environment, with, which means the condition is it's, it's that safe as long as you don't call set and yeah. Correct. Which is a bit, uh, you know. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. I think that what you have implemented here is a definite improvement. Well, you haven't looked at the patches yet. <laughs> <laughs> I this, know it's a definite improvement some, because it because the reporters have reported back that it fixes their use cases. So, they are, uh, so what they tested didn't include the environ snapshotting, and the environ snapshotting is problematic because it uses the stack, and if you have thousands of environment variables, that could be a problem because of increased stack usage. Yeah. If you have a minimal stack in a thread and it fails? But uh, there's is a way around doing that, but I've got a partial implementation. It's really complex because um, it's common to call execve after vfork. Mm -hmm. And if we mmap something doing vfork and the execve succeeds, then the, MMAP, uh, the new mapping leaks into the parent process and gets never deallocated. So you need to have some magic to make that happen, which is kind of difficult because you need to call it after an exec VE that succeeds, but then the process is gone. So it is a bit complicated, but it's, so, but it's not in this series because I wanted to present the yeah. approach with the stack copy. But you're saying this doesn't suffer from this problem right now. You haven't attempted the more complex fix, so you don't have a mapping it, it issue here. To, it, it, it creates simplicity for the unstack copy and uh, stack usage. So it's, it trades simplicity for mm -hmm. increased stack usage. That yes, is. and that's okay. Um, is, yeah. The question is, if you have a, and I haven't, again, I haven't reviewed this series in full, I got it assigned as a reviewer pool delegate, but it's in my backlog because it's so big to review. And before I get to this one, I have to review the uh, pi uh, load hint one. I think convar is more important than this, by the way. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that, is, that can be true. Then this is going to wait or we find another delegate for review for the series. So, but it's pretty complicated code. And you I mean, it even even part of this, if part so, of this goes in, would be an improvement. Yes. So, but we have until uh, February to do the. I mean, February is the release. We would want to get this in sometime before the end of the year and then review it. Okay. So you've raised the issue that the desktop ecosystem community got a patch, got a build from you. <laughs> You're like, hey, test this build out. They're like, this build works so good. We're just going to expect that on the next release, the changes that you proposed in this test build work perfectly fine. And so now you're saying there, there might be a bit of an expectation that you did such a good job fixing their problem that they'd like, they, the desktop community would like to see this fixed because uh, the set end that makes things kind of unsafe is can be made safe, right, if we do a particular sequence of steps. Um, there isn't any, as far as I know, none of this is in the performance hot path when you're setting environment variables and getting environment variables. Nobody's going to, I can't imagine anyone would say this is a hot loop that I'm setting environment variables. So, because it's usually in response to something. Um, there's a, two additional like choir loads in the get -inf code, so. It yeah, should, uh, get events really slow because of the string, the string comparisons. So yes, exactly. Matter. Yeah, you're doing string comp and doing comparisons anyway. Unset so. env is a bit slower, but yeah, 
I mean, who calls Unset and so that does uh, a couple of additional release stores that okay. aren't there before. But it it already does locking, so yeah, it, yeah, it's not the fastest one. I agree. Anyway. Yeah. So performance wise, it should be okay. Compatibility impact is only from the stack usage because GetEnv doesn't do new locking. So I have a question for you. Why did we fail CI right here? Was this a Linero tester? Uh, was I it 32-bit ARM? Anymore. I th I'm not even sure if it was spurious. Was it spurious? No, uh, patch series failed to apply. Yeah, that was spurious. Yeah, it, it does because uh, we applied the patch and it succeeded. Uh, something could have landed in between the two, but otherwise the Linero builder built fine. So that's fine. Yeah. So this went a lot of, uh, through a lot of parallel testing, uh, concurrency testing on power and AR64 using those special new test cases. And there weren't any issues anymore. I mean, the first version had problems. <laughs> this one seems to be okay. Okay, perfect. Okay. Um, anything else we want to look for for the release? I have a question. Yeah. Uh, regarding get and marry. Uh, you said you want to export that symbol, but that's not for this series, right? Right. Yeah, Florian said get and array was an internal interface he created for this series, but it's yeah. not exported by these patches, so we're not adding an external ABI that sure. needs more delicate review. Uh, considerations for standardization, or is it going to be a GNU extension? How do you want to treat it? I mean, if it's if it's standardization proposal, then we should probably talk to Joseph and have that proposed or something like that. I am not sure if uh, other Lipsys consider this a problem because they generally dislike direct manipulation of the environment and then probably have logging and get end for something like that. But we can't add logging to get end because of uh, it, it hasn't been there historically, so. Yeah, as soon as you add locking to it, it'll yeah. probably deadlock somewhere for and some. Yeah, you might, uh, malloc might use it while holding any malloc locks. And yeah. I don't know that. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't know if get env array is uh, the right interface to standardize. Um, it makes a copy and doesn't do a snapshot of the or shared snap, it doesn't create a shared snapshot of the environment, it makes a copy because I expect the usage will be I make an array of the environment and copy into that on the stack maybe and see if it fits into like 100 element array and then add I my, my own environment variable if there's still not room, uh, if there's still room and if there's no room, I make a heap allocation instead and then pass the whole modified environment array to POSIX spawn so I think that's going to be the use case for it. But um, that's why I think the copy approach is useful, but other people yeah. might have other. So for, so for clarity, you're saying the copy approach can then get fed to other functions that then take the entire yeah. environment, array. Yeah, you would, you would uh, add your environment variable and call POSIX spawn to that or something yeah. like that. So that's why I'm, I think it makes sense to, to have that copy instead of doing a snapshot that yeah, you get your own copy, and then you can do whatever you want with yeah. the copy without any implications of uh, multi-threaded safety. Okay. Yeah. Well, so the alternative could be that I keep trying to fix Convar, and we find someone else to do the review for GetEnv. Okay. Arjun. So this is about uh, new contributors or trying to get new contributors. Mm -hmm. uh, last summer, I did a little talk about like how to get your first patch into glibc in Brno, and there was a lot of interest during the talk, and like there were conversations. People were it looked like something will come out of it, and uh, like it led to zero patches. Um, so this summer that just passed, I decided that I'll do a workshop instead, and kind of like give individual problems. So I handed out like a dozen and a half like problems of varying degrees. It was mostly like new tests or modify make files or 
fix up a script, and uh, I actually got five batches out of it that were, uh, I think four were submitted, one is still in progress. Feels good to me to have gotten that. Um, and uh, I got some help for, uh, during the, these past review meetings. Uh, I think it was AJ who pointed out, like, maybe I could look for untested interfaces. You know, like, look, at, look at all the symbols we export, look at w all the symbols that are, like, uh, referred to in the test suite. And if you remember, we did a little bit of set and got some lists, right? Um, I'm just wondering if, like, there's others interested in finding easy, not important enough to be done things that we could have a corpus of, like, actually, GCC has this. They, they have it. It's called Easy Hack. They, they have a little tag. I don't know how well it's maintained for bugs. Uh, and I, I remember my first GC, and only GCC patch was through one of these bugs. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering if there's like any interest in like having a corpus of things for beginners to like maybe come and look at and be like super easy and just get a patch in. I, I know it costs us some effort, yeah. bit, but if we get a hundred new patches from a hundred people, maybe one of them will become a GLPC developer like next to you. Who knows? I agree. I want to ask you a question, like a follow on question. Did the availability of the easy hack, was that what led to the success of your four contributions? Absolutely. So I had, I had a list of interfaces that were untested and I gave like, not every, every uh, problem I handed out led to a batch. I, I gave like 20 of them. So I think I got three new tests out of it and a uh, couple of make file changes, which mm -hmm. like it wasn't, it doesn't lead to much for us, but it was still okay. It was the yeah. first patch. I'll write back to them and say if they want to do a new test, maybe, who knows? Yeah. I I'm trying to like phrase my question so I don't ask the like leading question. Because for me, I think the leading question is, I think the four were successful because of you, right? And that like the availability of the easy hacks was one thing, but you being available yourself as a mentor for these four people that were submitting the patches, how much involvement did you put in with these four? So during the workshop, there was maybe 25 people. Yeah. Many of them took an A4 sheet with me with the problem, mm -hmm. in individual problem. They were all working through it. I was like trying to point out how they could work on it. So me being there maybe helped a bit, I guess. I think the, the first patches came out the, the very next day, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Those are the really easy ones. Did you jump on them and then review them? I think I, think I did, yeah. You handed them to me actually because you knew about it, <laughs> right? <laughs> so uh, maybe like, like, I don't want to take all the credit, but the point is that... I think you should take all the credit. I think you did a fantastic the, job there. Having yeah. the easy problems, uh, may, maybe like me pushing them onto, onto these people during the yeah. workshop was like the thing, but also having the problems was a thing. Sure. And I'm just wondering, like, maybe we should have more of them. Maybe we could have 20 problems and... Yeah. I don't know. Just a thought. Well, I mean, we do try to identify those. Yeah. Bradley at the very back has his hand up as well. Yeah. Um, we do try to identify those like on the GCC side and say, all right, these are, are I think we mark them, I don't know what our tags are, but um, I use those essentially as training tools. Somebody coming into the project, here's something I, I kind of know how we're going to fix it. And so I can kind of guide them towards it and say, all right, here's what we want to get out of it. And I understand at the end, did they actually get it right? Because I've already kind of fixed it myself. But the point being is, it is fantastic to have these things kind of lined up so when somebody asks, hey, I want to contribute, I can say, here's a bug. It's going to help me ever so slightly, but more importantly, it's going to give you a chance to start learning about a piece of this code that you've never had to work on before. So it sounds like there might have been a question somewhere in the back. I'll run it out. Yep. Thanks. It's like, it's like a one, yeah, very <laughs> narrow. <laughs> yeah, I think test testing a function, even just calling it with the right arguments is straight is a net positive step. Uh, you might want to broaden your view of like what the easy hacks uh, can be used for. I use myself as an example. Like I, I'm a policy person these days, not a programmer. I learned about the GCC easy hacks last year at this conference, and I started working on one as a just relaxing thing to do because I don't program that often, and I'm not up to date on the, I haven't looked deep in the GCC code base since 1999. So it's not just for newcomers. People who um, 
want to contribute uh, in a casual way. I, I mean, I, I mean, the bug I was working on last year is still open. I worked on it a little bit during the uh, during the um, tutorial this morning, right? Eventually, I'll probably finish it. It's not something that's that that anybody wants to do. I'm not going to tell you which one it is because I want it. Uh, but but I, I think think about the broadness of of making the project available to people who want to be casual contributors, uh, uh, not just people who are newcomers that are going to become long-term contributors. And that's what I think the Easy Hacks thing is useful for, and I think GLibc should have one too. You make a really good point that there is probably a variety of ways people want to engage with the project. And I think there is, um, so HJ was a very senior developer for Intel. A lot of us know him. He just retired. Like, and I wonder if I retire, like, I'd love to be a casual contributor. I'd love to like just work on that one problem that nobody else cares about. I love solving technical puzzles. I love taking the Rubik's Cube and organizing it to all the faces are blue. I don't care about the other sides of the faces, just one side's blue. But I, and I can imagine, I agree, Bradley, that there's probably a bunch of different ways in which people want to engage with the project. So that's a good point. Um, so one thing to consider as well, you, you mentioned that uh, it was not, not only the, probably not only the availability of the easy bugs, but also the availability of the mentor. Mm -hmm. um, but something I encounter in Ubuntu where I'm asked to mentor folks into getting core dev rights, uh, they ask me, what can I work on? And some of the tasks, we, you have like uh, different things that you need to be able to do. But some of them, I'm actually, I don't have anything at hand to give them because uh, that's something, when I say it, I just fix it. It's much easier than trying to coach someone into it. And I need to make an effort to not fix it and just set that aside thinking, wait, somebody else might need to. And the, if I had this, if I had a list like this, it will actually allow me to mentor more people mm -hmm. because I spend less time trying to, you know, find something for them to do. So I think just the availability of the bugs would also free, maybe allow more people to mentor the new developers. Sure. So is, is your request perhaps an ask of Arjun to put, I mean, like we can just put them in as bugs and put a label on them. My ask is that hold on. a senior... The, hold on. Works. You cannot give a senior person additional work because we are currently reviewing your patches or other people's patches. No, so maybe point <laughs> me to, uh, to places where I can find problems and I'll, I'll be happy to document them yeah. or, or collate them somewhere because I just don't know enough about GLIPC to be able to list all the things that need to be done which are not so important right now, but... I think you do. What? Yeah. I think that's what, that's what Jeff was <laughs> Find bugs and then tag it in the easy fix. Maybe we should start using that easy hack or, yeah. Do you, I mean, like, I think it's, it could be something that, like, my suggestion to you is, if there are test cases we haven't converted to the test framework, is it one bug per test and then file a hundred bugs or something and... And then that way they're available for someone to come and try to handle those. And we label them all. It's kind of a pain, but. We've got something like maybe 1,000 or 2,000 open bugs in GLibc. So if we had a Bugzilla keyword, then people could look at bugs and add a keyword to say, we think this is an easy thing for a new, we think this is both a valid bug that should be fixed and easy for a new contributor to work on. It would require some of you, but the total number of bugs is comparatively manageable. Yes, you could search and see how many there are. Well, I'm admin on the Bugzilla, so when, as soon as I add the tag, it's common to every project. <laughs> Not only would, would I say let's commonize the tag, um, up until now, a lot of the stuff it's I'm there. doing and just CCing myself and saying, this is a bug I want to make sure I can find in a month. Um, so when we tag something with an easy hack or an easy fix, it probably should have some, whoever put that tag on there 
should have their name as a contact point because they probably already know how they want it fixed. So because uh, good first bug is here already, it looks like GDB is using good first bug. I guess it's not GDB as a keyword. No, there's no such thing as a GDB only keyword because the database doesn't express it that way. We have, uh, this is the non-GCC Bugzilla instance. So when I go to... Yeah. Well, I should be able to. Good first bug. Um, do we have an open easy bug for glibc? I guess just any bug for glibc, right? Yeah. Yeah. Search. Yeah, that's what I was gonna do. I know what that one is. It's two five eight zero seven. G five eight zero seven. Oh no. Not the, sorry, uh, that's a GDB one. Oh, I can't believe I forgot, two, five, all right. Uh, let's see, let's find a glibc one. All right, here's the locale support. Full support for GB1830. This is not an easy bug, but Mike, I know Mike, so he's, he's not gonna get upset with us. Okay, so this one, we should be able to put the keyword yeah, it's like the Archer keywords there. And so good first bug is here. Yeah, there it is. Right, I could put it in. Yeah. So I just had a question there for things like this and on your experience in this, Jeff. Um, we do similar things for interns, like between me and Tamar, we keep trying to come up with new starter tasks for interns. The amount of times we think, oh, this should be easy, and then they start working, and it's like, oh, dear, no, this is like a, a two-year project or something. Um, yeah. yeah, but I find it happens more often than, than not. So I just, uh, we need to make sure that we tell people that we may be wrong. So Because if they get started on this and they think, oh, this is a good first bug, it should be easy. This is a terrible first bug. <laughs> <laughs> and when it's not... Yeah. I just said, this is something I, I know I can use as a training exercise, and it's not critically important to get a patch pushed right now. Yeah. I already know how to do it. Yeah, that's my other problem. Most of the time when we come across things like that, we do just commit it, and then it's done, and yeah. Do, well, way, being the... senior means not doing those things because you need to use them for another purpose. So... Additional stuff where you just need to like run a benchmark or come up with a test for it or something like that, where it's like I wrote the patch, but then some more stuff needs to get done and it's not super high priority, but nobody really has time to do it right now. Mm. So maybe there's a patch on the list and it just needs some love or something. I, yeah. Right. So, Arjun, when you ran the workshop, because this is now the second time you've run this thing, I really appreciate the fact that you're using, that you're writing these talks and you're, 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 you're looking at what went right changing it, doing it again, what went right, changing it, doing it again. Um, for your workshop and the problems you handed out, were they all test suite conversions or new test interfaces that were untested? Or did you, or did you find other easy bugs? Um, I only had a list of uh, untested interfaces and uh, some make file changes and a couple of wish list items for scripts in language X that need to be rewritten in language Y. But those didn't convert to patches. Uh, I just got some make file changes and some test uh, additions, basically. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's, that's... If we filed bugs for all those, that would be fantastic. Yeah. I, I lost the list, so I'll, I'll recreate it. <laughs> I, but uh, yeah, I'll, I'll do that. I'll do yeah, yeah. file bugs. Do we, how did you find the ladder? Did you like uh, look at every exported public global symbol and then attempt to find if it was called in a test? Yes, but there's like false positives there because sometimes, um, mm -hmm. you know, you function is, is actually some other function and then you feel like you've not tested it. But, but uh, you can't grep have... it. You probably have to look at the generated binaries in the build directory and look for undefined references to the symbols in there. Yeah. 
Yes, so that's, that's what I did in my script when I was looking for untested interfaces. I looked for anything that wasn't referenced at all as a dynamic symbol in any of the executables, I think, in the build directory after running the test suite. Now, I have in fact wondered, would it make sense to try and run most of the Ulibsy test suite with, with coverage testing enabled for most of Ulibsy and find lots more, no doubt, untested code within functions? It's probably a bit harder to enable coverage, code coverage, for but it should be possible for most of Ulipsy. And I'm sure that will find a virtually infinite range of places where, yes, there's some test this function, but lots of paths within it are not tested. Uh, Gosh, I... you, you went down a, like, that's a deep, deep path, but the answer is yes. However, when you run coverage testing, Sure, you find a ton of gaps. That's open source, that's FOSS. And the question is, which of those gaps is impactful to close? Which are we energized? Which are we motivated to close? Just finding them is the one piece. So I don't like, until we have a reason, I think, to close some of the gaps or a, or a purpose because that gap Although we say it's untested, maybe there's just tons of code and operation that uses it, and we would have gotten feedback if we broke it. So it is actually okay, and us adding coverage doesn't really help the ecosystem at all, or doesn't help other people or end users running that code. Yeah. yeah. I was going to say something about coverage. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, at the very least, so a new contributor who wants to learn to write a test could try and write a test for this bit of code. And even if it's not, even if it doesn't have much value to test it, it has helped get a new contributor up to speed with writing a Julibsy test. Well, now you've just given purpose to the, to, the, to the coverage example that has nothing to do with actual coverage. It has to do with, here's a really interesting technical puzzle. There's a line in the code that we can't hit. Can you find a way to to hit that line in the code. And I think really interesting would be like gamify hitting all the cut points in the libm uh, code that we have for all the like algorithm cut points, like where tan or ctan or something hits a cut point where we make an, uh, a choice about how the implementation resolves the function. But as you said, what you just gave was no. motivation. Correct. Why? There'd be motivation there for sure. So for the Motivation might be, I want to get to 100. There mm -hmm. actually is a case in Rome where this came up. Where there, we have a package that's like 99.9%. There are error paths. We could decide that we want a 100% coverage. We decided against it, but that's the motivating. A potential motivating. Yeah. New contributors improving coverage by getting a test in place that covers one extra path. That's a good reason. But we uh, does that fall... So this is kind of the worst cases that I think, Andre, you were saying is like that one extra line of coverage. So it's re sometimes questionable whether you can even hit it. Like, is it undefined behavior to hit it? Is it an internal implementation detail? Is it like impossible to hit? So Florian and I were recently conversing about there is a streams F is it F close scenario where we have a piece of conditional code in F close that says, hey, if the stream's already closed, return EOF. And then you're like, we don't have any tests to cover that. And then you're like, wait a second, but if you've already called F close, the whole stream's been deallocated. It's entirely undefined behavior and a use after free if you call F close. What's this code doing here? Like, it can't. And then Florian said, no, the standard in, standard out, and standard air because they're global data, they never get freed. So it's technically possible to call fclose on them twice. Although it's undefined behavior, it returns EOF. It has to, it has to do... It's a degree of behavior. Yes, there's a, it's still undefined behavior to do that, but it, there's a degreeness of it that lets you actually test that path and return an EOF. But you just went from easy, easy bug to I know the, the C standard and the POSIX standard intimately. I can justify why this test case can exist. I can justify the implementation behavior might be used by a program today and that we can't change that line of code and then write a test case to fix it. So yeah. I want to know from the workshop that you did there, how much training did you actually have to do with those people to actually get them to 
build, test that. I mean, because I look on some of my new hires, I've had to do a lot of mentoring just to yeah. tell them how to yeah, configure yeah. GCC and how to run, how to, how to build it, how to install it, and then how to run the test suite. And then kind of at that point, then they can start to look at the easy bug. And then, of course, then if it has to go into the debugger, then there's more mentoring because, as Jeff knows, it's, you can't, you don't GDB GCC because that's just the driver. You actually have to go find out what the, the, the CC1 or CC1 plus thing is and, and all that, and, which takes a lot just, just to get someone to a point to fix an easy bug. There's a lot of work there. And so you have to know how to compare the results. And then you will find out that, well, if you have an old version of curl, the results are not consistent because of the way we combine some files. Yeah. So th th there is this whole other space of training to get somebody to where they can take that easy fix in source form to something that is integratable. Yeah. Well, and then, of course, GCC has lots of intermittent bugs that they fail, they pass, so depending on whatever, you know. For me, that highlights that, again, Arjun's success is because of Arjun, right? Like, the mentorship relationship that you set up is exactly what you need for the reasons that I think both of you are saying, that, like, there needs to be someone there who says, hey, by the way, it's not going to be clean. Don't worry about it. Oh, you're on this system? It's the Pro version. Don't worry about it. And even if you touch base just for a couple of minutes, you can really set someone on the right path towards completing their easy bug fix and getting it done. Because, like, they, let me ask, there was probably some... We don't have the easiest submission process when it comes to git send email, and I expect that you probably answered a fair number of first-time contributor questions around how do you get a, how do you get a, a patch on the mailing list, right? So, like, you were there as that touch point, I assume, right? Yeah. So yeah, the, we got one minute. The really. last year's talk, which led to zero patches, it was a talk. There was no workshop. That's why I did the workshop next year. Yeah. Right. Uh, there, there were questions like, "Why are you not on uh, GitHub?" I think it's even recorded <laughs> on YouTube somewhere. And I, did, uh, like, I think there were questions about like why it's hard to, to really contribute. But with the workshop, I think everybody had like you know tightened their belts and come to try and write a patch. So they weren't asking these questions. I don't recall like this. Like I think I mentioned that you know okay. it's a bit old school. We send email. And then, you know, we moved on very quickly. People tighten the belt and... So we moved on very quickly because I just told them like, hey, uh, run a make, and an make check. And uh, in the meanwhile, I'll show you how to write a test. So, you know, their laptops were buzzing away. And then we, we went quickly into a recent, uh, like recent short self-contained test. It was not a containerized test or anything. Mm -hmm. I just called an interface and uh, did some checks. So I showed them how the checks are, you know, like from support.h. So mostly it was me telling them, you know, you need to include support.h, you need to use these macros to do the verifies, and then you just need to call the interface that you are going yeah. to be testing. So that's like a lookup for the man page. So so a lot of, that's a lot of coaching. You basically parallelized your coaching for a half hour or something at that. Right, but it was like very specific interfaces, like yeah. nothing unusual going on there. Uh, which I ch I'd chosen, so yeah. it was a bit of a luxury, right? I wanted to see if I can get patches out of this. Yeah, that was my goal. That sounds awesome. And so, yeah, I skipped a lot of I skipped a lot of results, which were which I knew will go like not so well. Okay. So awesome. I want to give people time to go. So let's end the buff right now. Let's all get our things ready, and we'll have dinner, and we can continue this conversation at dinner time. Thank you, everybody.